Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, from Copenhagen Vineyard. I am, I'm, I'm the mother of two girls. I don't know, I have a picture of them here. There they are, and uh, I have a wonderful husband. I also have a picture of him. And um, sometimes I wonder if he's good company. I don't know. <laughs> Being criminal together with the, <laughs> together with the, um, the children. But um, I'm very passionate about uh, seeing God moving in people's lives, seeing God really transforming lives as he has been transforming my life. And that is my dream. That's what I'm working for. And I'm so passionate about that. Um, lately, I tried something totally new, something that I haven't tried uh, ever before. I went to a spiritual counselor. And um, I uh, looked forward to that. I looked forward to her advice, so I was sharing different stuff from my life, you know, challenges, uh, situations, and then I looked at her, and she looked at me, and I was, you know, uh, waiting for a good input, some guidance. But then she just said to me, oh, I see. And uh, what is God saying to you in that situation? And uh, I thought that was that surprising. So I was telling her some more stories and looked at her, expecting a good advice now. That's why I came. And then she replied in the exactly the same way. So I see, okay. And what is God saying to you? And... Um, I must admit, I was a bit disappointed because, to be honest, I had really looked forward to her counsel. And I thought to myself, this education of hers, you know, being spiritual counselor, it sounds really something special, but I thought it must really be a short education, you know, just asking people, so what is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? That's all she could say the whole hour. Uh, and um, in the end, I replied, well, that's exactly what I thought you would tell me. What is God saying to me? What is God saying into this situation? But she didn't. But after this conversation, uh, her persistent question, what is God saying to you? Okay, I see this situation, I see this problem, I see this challenge, what is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? It has not only inspired me, it has actually also admonished me. Because aren't we often too busy, or too superficial, or too just plain stupid to ask exactly that crucial question? in our lives. Even though we know that Jesus is saying this, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And that's my hope for this afternoon, that, that we will be able to hear his voice. That you will be able to hear his voice into your life, into your ministry, into the situations that you are in. That's my prayer and I think he will do it because I think he's in the room. So we live in a world of opinions like never ever before, I think. Everything is up for review um, and open for critique. How many stars do this thing have? How many likes does that thing ha have on, on, uh, on Facebook? Even this wonderful conference is being uh, reviewed. And uh, maybe I'm being evaluated too. I, I think I am, probably. Right now, maybe. And um, I don't know, are you aware, or is it only us from Denmark, are you aware that an, uh, uh, during this wonderful international vineyard event, a competing but l much less interesting international event is going on in Copenhagen? Are you, aware? Are you aware? It's a Eurovision Song Contest. And um, 
Actually, believe it or not, we were there for the semi-final. <laughs> we never do that, but somebody uh, gave us the tickets, and I can prove it if you think it's a story. That's from the semi-final from the Eurovision Song Contest, and it was horrible. It was... <sighs> oh, it was a show. I've never seen a show like that ever before. But it was a huge experience also, of course, for the girls. And I know I look very excited, but it's a scam. <laughs> the truth is that I was sitting feeling a little bit guilty, exposing my innocent children to a world where everything is rateable. We think it's an innocent game when we critique and review and quantify everything, but really, this mentality of critique, reviewing, rating, giving stars, it's really a seductive game. And all of us know it, all of us here know it because all of us has played it. It's so tempting to measure yourself according to the approval of others, isn't it? Um, I'm sorry, the light is so bad here. Um, and I'm just thinking, as I was preparing myself for this afternoon, as pastors, as leaders, I don't know what you are doing, maybe you're a small group leader or a children's ministry leader or anything, uh, we are more than ever before in danger of living our lives according to the opinions of others, chasing after their approval instead of grounding ourselves in the calling that we have from God and really filling ourselves with the peace that comes from living according to his call. And uh, I think many of us have been around maybe for many years and maybe you think I've given up a lot. I've really paid a price to follow him, to serve him in his kingdom. I don't think I am the only one who feels sometimes the pressure of expectations from other people. I don't think I'm the only one this afternoon who sometimes think uh, or find myself living too much for the approval of other people uh, instead of for God's calling on my life. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am 30 years old, no comments, no comments. Um, and um, I have just had my 10 year anniversary as a pastor in Copenhagen Vineyard. My children are not small anymore. And when you come to this stage in life, you start evaluating everything in your life, everything. You start asking yourself, how have I done until now? Which things in my life do I want to continue and what do I want to change? It's also called the 40 years crisis, but don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. And um, if you know the feeling of sitting in the changing uh, or in the dressing room at halftime between the two halves of any game and evaluating what should I change? How should I play the rest of this game? If you know that feeling of evaluating your own life, then the questions are, what is success and what is fiascos? What is God's perspective? What is God saying to you? And as leaders and pastors, these are the biggest questions, because if you listen to God's answer, if you listen to what God is saying to you, then you will be stirred and you will not be shaken. If you ask yourself these questions and listen for God's voice to talk to you, you will be stirred, but you will not be shaken. And that's what we want, don't we? Yeah. And I think sometimes uh, during our life, we need a second or a third or a 68th conversion. 
At one point in your life, you met Jesus, he gave you a brand new life, everything was wonderful, that was your first con conversion. But as uh, times go on, we can become so busy of doing very holy, very uh, righteous things. We can be so busy that we lose sight of our initial calling. We can be so busy praying for others, speaking God's words into others' life, advising others, serving others, etc., etc., year by year by year by year, that we can't hear what is God actually saying to me? What is he saying to me? I'm aware of what he's probably saying to other people. But what are you saying to me, God? And uh, without anybody noticing, we can lose ourselves in this game and all we can hear is the voices of other people now again the greatest hazard of all losing one's self can occur very quietly in the, the, the world as if it were nothing at all no other loss can occur so quietly any other laws, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed. Funny, yeah? You thought he was grumpy, but he's actually also funny, this, this thing. You know, over time, you can lose yourself. And um, that's when we need a second conversion in our life. That's when we need the Spirit of God to stir our hearts because we are so shaken by the sense of being inad inadequate and so tired of being some cool Christian leader who has the great uh, uh, stories to tell at some leaders meeting. We are so exhausted from trying to be rich Nathan rather than being Jesus. Who is your biggest hero? Who would you like to imitate? I didn't hear that. You know, the truth is we can't listen to the voice of God and listen to the voice of people at the same time. And when we do the ladder, when we, do, when we listen to, to the expectations from other people and chase for their approval, it is actually what the Bible calls idolatry. It's not Christianity at all. It is this religion. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that is my religion. So it's a totally other religion we are talking about. And we will never, ever, ever find peace. We will find frustration. We will find loneliness, we will find shame, for sure you will find exhaustion, but you will never ever find peace, you will never be satisfied, ever. So, what is success, what is fiasco? One day, Jesus had a serious chat with his disciples about just that, and that's the story that we will dive into this afternoon. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. It's shocking. It, it's a revolution he's starting here. Jesus is in Capernaum, probably in the house of Peter. And it's so extremely embarrassing because the disciples has taken up the old debate about who is the greatest, who is most loved, who is most uh, significant of us. And it must have been tempting for Jesus to be very annoyed and, you know, just tell the disciples off saying, how self-centered are you? The kingdom is near and you are discussing who is the greatest among you? What's going on with you? Because the whole discussion 
it's not very uh, high level at all. It's about one simple, simple thing. Even though that the disciples had been uh, walking closely with Jesus, even though that they had been answering the radical call, follow me, they had left everything behind, the boat, the family and everything, even though all of these things, their thoughts were still about themselves, their own ambitions, their own prides. What are people saying about me? That was their question. Instead of, what are you saying to me, God? They were asking, who is the greatest? And they still believed, after all these experiences with Jesus, wonderful things that they have experienced, they were still believing in their hearts that satisfaction and peace and success is gained through power and status. They were still firmly believing in that. They still believed that human be the thing that human beings generally believe, this is what we believe, if I can bend the will of others, I can become greater. If I can maximize my resources and have more influence, I will become greater. The more recognition, pats on the back, and admiration, the better. And if I can get a medal and become famous, I'm there. And maybe, when you think about these disciples, you can recognize uh, yourself in them. Maybe, I'm, ju I'm just suggesting it, it's probably not true, but maybe you have your own small competition about who is greater than me, who is less than me, going on inside of your head without anybody knowing. And Jesus takes advantage of this situation. And he wants to explain some really basic, but also really shocking truth uh, to the disciples. So he takes this vulnerable little child, and it could be any of these children, cute children running up and down the stairs. And then he says, surprisingly, I think probably the disciples were shocked. I tell you, my friends, on this, you completely change your way of thinking upside down. Unless you become like a little child, you can forget about even coming into my kingdom. You must be like this little child. You must be vulnerable. You must be aware that you have so much to learn. You must look at, up and realize that you are a child of someone who is so much bigger than yourself. If you want to be called great, my friends, Jesus said, you have to become small. The way up is the way down. The way down is the way up. That's the reality of the kingdom. That's the world I'm coming from, Jesus is saying. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying it, and he means it. It's radical. Another place in Matthew, a little bit earlier, he's saying it like this. Blessed are those who are spiritually needy. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. It's hard to grasp. It's really hard to grasp for, for us because it's so different from our worlds. And this Greek word for humble, tepinos, means to bend down. It means to realize suddenly the reality that Jesus is coming uh, and telling about. I'm totally dependent on God. I can't do it on my own. I need to empty myself for arrogance and pride. That's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. You know, we are called to be followers, not just admirers. And to be a follower of Jesus is to humble yourself and be like a little child. It is to realize I cannot do anything at all to become great in the kingdom of God. I must lie down flat on my face because it's him who is great. He is the great one. And then the miracle, the happy, wonderful miracle happens 
when we worship him, not just as a savior, savior of our sin, but also as a savior of this, uh, our inside striving to have a state the status that we can ca uh, call our own, you know. I can present this and this I'm proud of. Our striving to be able to say that. Then, when we accept him as a savior for us, it is possible to hear what God is saying to us and only then. You know you can't hear what God is saying to you if you don't want to empty yourself for pri pride and arrogance. Only then it's possible to not lose ourselves in a world of opinions. And finally, only then, receiving the identity of just being a child of God, then the Spirit of God is allowed to stir our hearts, stir our shaken hearts, and we realize because of Him, because of him, not because of me, but because of him, I am truly valuable. In fact, I'm a success. You know, Tom, he said that we shouldn't, uh, we should stop wanting to be the special one. But if you're a child of God, when we are a child of God, we are the special one. We need to be the special one. We want to be the special one. And we are the special one when we are a child of God. And um, that is what Jesus means when he says like this. And you have probably heard these places from the Bible. And this is what he's talking about. Anyone who lifts himself up will be brought down. And anyone who is brought down will be lifted up. Become my servants and learn from me. I am gentle and free of pride. You will find rest for your souls. And that's what we want, don't we? Serving me is easy, and my load is light. And Jacob is continuing this. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. We all know, I guess, that originally God created, created us for a life where we might just live with him, listen to his voice, receive his affirmation in all situations so that we don't need any other gods, so that we don't need any affirmation from anybody else. But what the disciples didn't realize, and I think what we often don't realize, what I often don't realize is that the second we start trying to conquer our own dignity, our own honor, our own happiness, our own freedom, our own peace. We lose it. We simply lose the ability to receive the life, the wonderful life that God has for us as his children. And that is a terrible place to be, having lost that sense, that reality that I'm a I'm a child of God, especially if you have decided and paid a high price to be his servant and to lead in his kingdom. And I'm just thinking that at a conference like this, what is important? It's important to worship. It's important to, uh, you know, catch up. But it's very, very important. If we want to have a conference about being stirred and not shaken, uh, to remind ourselves to remind each other in a very loving way that we have to stop our ongoing internal discussion about who is the greatest, who is the greatest in my working place, who is the greatest among my, my siblings, and so on and so on. We have to stop asking who gets the credit, who is the most loved, who is special. We are, you know, not the Eurovision Song Contest, Thank God we are the children of him. Yeah? Hallelujah. So if we go down that wrong road, we will always feel like failure. And I think many of us have felt like that. We will always feel like losers. We will feel like fiascos because it's not a good way for us. It's not what God meant 
uh, for us or has for us. We have to stop and we have to ask God, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me? Because the most important thing in our entire life of ministry is not to count and rate and review ourselves according to our human standards. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing and probably the most difficult thing is to stay a child of God. Listening to our Heavenly Father's voice, listening to what He's saying to us. And it's so simple that a child can succeed, a little child. And at the same time, it's so difficult that even the disciples who had experienced so much couldn't get it. You know, to serve Jesus is simply to live like a child of God, as a child of God in all of life's circumstances. That's it. That's it. In any situation in your life, in any challenge, in any victory, to stay a child of God, to think like a child of God, to act like a child of God, to speak like a child of God. The highest and most beautiful thing in life are not to be heard about, not, nor read about, nor seen, but, one will, but if one will, are to be lived. Life is not a problem to be solved, you know. It is a, a reality to be experienced. Uh, and one day after church, I was um, um, talking to my da uh, daughter, uh, speaking to my daughter, uh, uh, she's eight years old, about famous people. And she knew several uh, famous people. She knew the queen. She knew Basim, who will, you will not be able to hear tonight. So sorry for you. <laughs> you will uh, be able to hear James instead. Uh, and then she said suddenly, you know, mom, I'm famous too. And then I said, stupidly, as, as stupid as I was, no, you're not really famous. And then she said, yes, I'm famous. Er, how did I say that in English? I, I'm famous to God, and that's much better. That's what she said. And I thought, yes, Children's Church, thank you so much for bringing this uh, profound insight into my child's uh, life. I don't know, uh, is anybody here leading children's church or working with children? I think you should have a medal for teaching children that they are a success because they can be children of God. What a profound insight in early in life. And um, for, for my situation, I just thought, oh, I have found my role model, because if I can say like she is saying with my whole heart, I'm famous to God and that's much better, then I'm not only safe, I also have peace. And in our adult world, success and greatness is to be able to show great results. That's what we want. We want to show great results. We want to sit in that dressing room and be able to think back on great results, victories. Uh, in the kingdom, there's another principle. In God's reality, you are a great success if you can say, I'm known by God, I'm famous to God, and that's the most in important thing for me. And you know what? You can say that when you're eight years old, and you can say that when you're sitting nine years old in the old people's home, and maybe nobody wants to uh, come and, and visit you. You can say that when you have a good reputation, and you can say that when you have a bad reputation. You can say that when you are admired, and you can say that when you're disliked. You can say that uh, when you are down and when you are up. You can say, I can be 
uh, or you can say nothing can change that I am a triumphant winner. I can worship God with a sense of victory. You can be on your, what is it called, death, deathbed with a smile, with a victorious smile because you're a child of God. All because you can say, I know what God is saying to me. I know what God is saying to me. And uh, I think, I felt that God is saying to some of us, you need a second conversion, my friend. You need a second conversion. Well done. Yeah, I see that you are working hard, but you need a second conversion. Forget about competition. Forget about who is the greatest. Forget about, oh, am I good enough? Oh, I'm probably not good enough. I know some of you think like that. I think like that often. Some of us need to realize that uh, when Jesus is saying, you know, these wonderful words about um, his love for us, it's for you. In Romans, for instance, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. Some of us just need to take that in on a much deeper level, I believe. And you know if it's you. You know if you are tired because of the uh, pressure from uh, uh, wanting to be um, to have an applause and I would like to ask when was the last time that Jesus really stirred your heart and you could not do nothing but just worship him uh, because of his sup supreme reality that when he is speaking of those who are his, those who will come to him and will always be with him in his kingdom, it is you he is talking about. That reality. When was the last time that your heart was stirred by that? No hidden expectations, no conditions when it comes to Jesus. It's a gift. It's so hard to grasp. But it's a reality that we can just, you know, live. Man is a fallen star till he is right with heaven. He is out of order with himself and all around him till he occupies his true place in relation to God. When he serves God, he has reached that point where he both serves himself best and enjoy himself uh, most. It is man's honor, it is man's joy, it is man's heaven to live unto God. And then, when we step into that reality, secure in his victory, secure in the reality that you are the special one because you are his child, then and only then we can um, see other people in a whole new perspective. We can see that actually, when we receive them, we re receive Jesus. Only when we are f uh, a child of God and really taking that in, we are free of our own agendas. Only then it's not about what they can give us. Only then, uh, when we are grounded in the truth, I'm famous to God, and that's the most important, then we can receive people in a way where they see God and not us and our insecurities. It is only when we are children of God, first of all, that we are not getting in the way of God in our ministry. Without being God's children, first and foremost, we will never see Jesus in other people. We can't see it. And... Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels so complicated to be a leader in a church, but it is so simple for God. 
And uh, it's so revealing to think about that or to realize that. It's about living out the success Jesus has given you. It's about refusing the temptation of our world view of success. Uh, our world's view of success that uh, success is something from the outside fulfilling you inside. It's a lie. It's not working like that. Success is, is something that God is doing inside you, and then it's coming out. It's not outside in, it's inside out. And maybe you ask yourself at this conference or just all the time, what should I do? I mean, I, I, I'm not successful. My home group went down, nobody's calling me, nobody is coming to me for advice, nobody is asking me of anything, nobody seems to be interested. What should I do? How can I serve God? Am I just finished? And um, then I just want to, if you feel like that, I want to encourage you to listen uh, to the voice of God, what God is saying to you, because I think He's talking to you. I think He's speaking to you all the time because he's, you, are, you are His child and He died so that you could be His child. And I think He's saying to you, I'm all around you. I'm all around you. I'm really with you still. When you offer your friendship to somebody, when you receive somebody in my name, you actually receive me. It really does not count at all if anybody else notice. Who cares? I notice. It's you and me. Nobody, nobody needs to rate you. Nobody needs to applaud you. And I'm sure that if you want, God will talk to you and show you who he wants you to receive as a child of him and then you receive him and that's amazing and um, that is how the kingdom works often we forget that I think we think that the kingdom works if we are really uh, capable if we perform really well but the kingdom has something to do with a child of God staying a child of God it's not through human strength. And I know it because actually I'm standing here because one high school girl from my brother's high school class met Jesus, became a, a, a child of God, and uh, she invited my brother, oldest brother, along to some meeting, and he met Jesus and he became a child of God. Then he told my next brother, Søren, and uh, I think some of you have met him because he and his wife, Lisa, is a part of Vineyard, and they are now actually uh, planting a vineyard in Myanmar. And uh, Søren, that brother, he was really living a life far away from God. He was into black magic. He was into drugs. And... Uh, at one point, he disappeared for two years. It's a long story with him. But suddenly, he became a believer, and he wrote a letter to my family about, I'm now a child of God. And all that made a big impact on me. I'm, I'm some years younger. But one day, I was just saying to God, I want to give you my life if, if I can become a child of God. And it turned my life around. The next one was my sister. She came to faith and became a, a, a child of God, but her husband was a hardcore a Hungarian atheist, and I thought, that's a hard one, God. Can you do this one too? But one day, she had invited him uh, to a, meet, a Christian meeting, and she was taking care of uh, their kids, and suddenly she saw him at the stage saying, I want to be a child of God. And um, it has just been an adventure. And it's all through a high, a, an ordinary high school girl becoming a child of God, acting like a child of God. And it's always through ordinary people like you and me acting 
being a child of God. That's how the kingdom uh, evolves. That's how the kingdom grows. And we can do it because to be a child of God is a gift. It's something he has done for us because he died on the cross. So we have everything it takes to build his kingdom for other people to become children of God. And that's how uh, it works. It's not through human strength. Last year, I was at uh, the NLC, that's a, just a small vineyard leaders conference in England. Maybe you've heard about it. And uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, were there, I think it was last year or it was the year before, doesn't matter. Uh, and um, he is called Justin Welby. I have a picture of him at the NLC here. And then I also have a picture of him at, at, at a carnival here. <laughs> Many, but he was uh, asked by the Archbishop of the Vineyard in England, John Mumford, do you have a word for us as a movement? Do you feel God is speaking through you to us? And then uh, he answered really quickly, yes, my prayer for you as a movement, my prayer for you as a vineyard is that all of you will be able to uh, lead someone to Christ. That's it. That's, that was his word for us. And um, we are not here, you know, to build nice, comfortable churches for the 3%, the tiny 3% of the Nordic population who already goes to church. We are actually here to reach out to the 97%, at least that's the situation in Denmark, that does not go to church, that are, that are not living a life of being just a child of God. We are here to receive them in the name of Jesus. And if we uh, want that, if we want to succeed in that, we need to be totally grounded as God's children. That's what I felt God had for us this afternoon, but I want to just finish with this quote. As God's children, we are entitled to use the same defense as the Son of God himself. Store scripture in your heart and know how to use it. Keep your eyes on God and trust him for everything. Remember your calling to bring God's light into the world. And say a firm no to the voices that lure you back in the darkness. Can we stand and just pray shortly together?